Good morning. Despite the inclement weather, we are going to start just about on time. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. This is a very special Grand Rounds. This is actually um, the third medical education day for the Department of Medicine. Um, and uh, along that line, there are activities at the Centennial Building to follow this through the morning with a session uh, at the noontime hour and lunch, I'm told, at 1130. If you're there uh, and can join us, please do. Um, the person who really has been responsible for developing ed Medical Education Day in the Department of Medicine is Laura Zakowski, Associate Vice Chair for Undergraduate Medical Education. And I'd like to, uh, for us all to welcome Dr. Zakowski as she introduces today's Grand Round speakers. Welcome, Laura. It's not only a great day for education, but for snowmobilers, skiers, and snowshoers everywhere. So I want to, we have two great presentations today and three speakers. I'll introduce the first two speakers for the first presentation, then I'll introduce the second speaker for the second presentation. So Laura Morsetter, Dr. Morsetter received her DO degree from Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed her residency and chief residency at Advocate General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. She completed her fellowship in nephrology here at UW, and she is now the nephrology fellowship director, the VA nephrology section chief, and the deputy director of the American Society of Nephrology National Board Review Course and Update. Dr. Morsetter has received a number of awards, including the DOM Clinical Excellence Award, the Excellence in Teaching Award from the Medicine Residents, and the DOM Graham Meyer Teaching Award for Excellence in Ambulatory Teaching. She recently published papers in the Seminars in Dialysis Journal regarding Renal Fellow Education in Dialysis and in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology about enhancing nephrology career interest in medical students. She has received grant funding from our DOM Education Committee to teach quality improvement in an asynchronous method, which she and Ian Todaro will present today. Ian Todaro received his MS degree in Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis from UW. He was our Internal Medicine Fellowship Coordinator up until December. In that role, he provided leadership to the 16 Internal Medicine Fellowship programs that trained 75 fellows in our department. His work with the department was excellent as he collaborated with fellowship coordinators, the faculty in our department, and across the school and UW hospital to develop and evaluate centralized training curricula and data management systems. He has presented scholarly projects for the ACGME Education Conference, the Alliance for Academic Internal Medicine, and at our own Medical Education Day. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for making it here. It's a struggle, I know, in the, in the uh, snowstorm today. Um, we do not have any financial disclosures, but we do love our QI curriculum. And so we're going to say we have a personal bias against that, so take it with a grain of salt as we move forward. 36% of diabetic patients seen in the UW Endocrinology Clinic had properly documented foot examinations. 27% of UW palliative care patients who received a new opioid prescription have a documented substance abuse screening. 64% of UW ICU patients had a family meeting by day four of their hospitalization. So none of this data is meant to say that we're not taking excellent care of patients at UW, but rather to show some of the gaps in care that our fellows have identified over the time that they spent in QI. Over the last four years, 205 of our Department of Medicine fellows have gone through our curriculum and developed 83 projects. But today is not a day about QI, it's a bit day about education, and so what we want to do is try to differentiate for you a little bit more about what changes in the adult learner. Then we will discuss how we integrated these theories into a curriculum we delivered to fellows over the last few years as an example of the application of those theories. And lastly, we're going to consider ways that you can maybe apply some of these theories to your own teaching opportunities. So traditionally, we all came into education with the, the idea that our teacher was in charge of us. And so we really spent time with, um, trusting that that educator would bring to us the knowledge that we needed to know. We trusted that they knew what, what it was that we needed to learn. 
And they brought with them the method of teaching that, we, that they thought was best for us. Um, with that, it's kind of an authoritarian system. And so we, we just did what they said. And it's been interesting as I've learned more about this to think about my kids. And it's funny to me to think that they just learn things because they don't know why they're learning things. My eight-year-old knows that she wants to graduate, but she has no idea why or what it really means to graduate. On the other hand, adult learners are different. They may be more goal-directed because they bring with them a variety of life or social experiences and may have outside factors that drive their learning, such as family responsibilities or specific career goals. So in the traditional sense, the learner just trusts the educator, and they go through this learning journey as a means to an end, but not really necessarily knowing what that end is. The adult learner, on the other hand, questions why they need to know the certain information, how this information relates to their frame of reference, which includes their past experiences, and how this knowledge fits into the ultimate goals they are pursuing. So we're going to talk about two different adult learning theories today. Um, there's lots and lots of them that are published, but one of, the, one of the most famous ones is from Malcolm Knowles. And it's interesting to think about, and I want you to think about yourself as you've gone through this education journey and try to relate to this. Um, when we take on new social roles or jobs, when our jobs change, sometimes we have different goals that come about. Um, we become ready to learn new information. And let's think about our interns. So when they come into intern year, we have this orientation for them, and they realize that that EPIC training is actually essential. Now, the rest of us might complain about it, but that EPIC training is essential because they know that order entry is super important for them to survive. And so they may pay particular attention to that because they have this new mindset of how much they need to know that. But they probably do have prior EMR experience. So they have seen an EMR before, and it makes them ready to learn this, but in the frame of reference of what they already know. And then in doing this, they're motivated because they know what it is that they really need to spend their time doing because they know what, what's coming. Then as they move forward away from orientation, they start to apply what they've learned to the patient care experiences that they have. So they're taking that information, bringing it to those patient care experiences, and maybe even seeing some gaps in, in knowledge that they don't really know yet. And so as they see those gaps, then they become ready to look for those answers. And so they become more self-directed because they see those gaps and seek out that information to fill in the gaps. So that's kind of the theory that Malcolm Knowles had, um, is can we assume these different things about the adult learner to be able to make this happen in a way that's a little different than the traditional sense? So does this really work? Well. According to some neuronal networks in um, memory and cognition, basic science has said that this actually is plausible. But there's been about 300 papers published on Malcolm Knowles' theories, and nothing has really come to fruition to say that it's any better than the traditional methods. And, and that was a little disappointing, because I really identify with this theory, but at the same time, it's, it's unfortunate it hasn't really been, published, or been, been um, sought out in literature to be able to say it's much better. These are some parts of the theories that have been able to be positively sought. But I really liked this, this quote. And it says, and I think you can relate to this when you teach medical students and you look at the differences between medical students and residents. But it says that students tend to behave dependently when they are in a structured educational setting. This dependent behavior becomes, or maybe because these learners do not know how to learn, but they only know how to be taught. And so as we have that dependent situation, people really depend on that teacher, and, and they haven't really learned how to learn. And I think that that's the part that's hard to measure and why this hasn't maybe shown to be true. But you also have to um, have a learner who is ready to be self-directed. And so one of Malcolm Knowles' students actually came up with a, an assessment tool to be able to see um, kind of where are you in that scale of, of learning. And so this is two people at the same level um, of learning, um, they may be both in my house, um, who uh, took this test to be able to see. And, uh, and so the first person is quite, um, quite independent in their um, abilities to self-direct their learning, whereas the other person is a little bit more dependent, not wanting to take on that full responsibility. So you can see that over the gamut of education, this might change. The second learning theory was developed by David Cole. He describes this learning as a stepwise process where a learner encounters new experiences, reflects on gaps that occurred during that experience, 
and seeks out new knowledge and then tests this new knowledge or skill as a result of their reflection. Uh, let's take an example, a clinical example of a fellow who admits a new patient to the general medicine floor. The patient's family was upset because the medication administration was delayed due to order processing. Later, the fellow reflects on the gap in where the care, uh, on where the gap in care was found, and discusses this with an attending who teaches the fellow how to do it a little bit better. Experiential learning researchers like Janet Moon cite feedback like the type the fellow has sought in this example as a key component of the effective learning cycle. The last step is where the fellows test this new knowledge in another patient encounter to see if his or her, her skills have improved. There are, another, there are other levels of complexity to this theory, but we've highlighted the basic parts for the sake of time. Most of our clinical experience are experiential learning based, but what really enriches the learning is when the learner has, is prompted to or has the opportunity to reflect, uh, receive feedback to identify their knowledge gaps, and the opportunity to then test this new knowledge. In a sense, it's a more structured way of knowledge formation than the old uh, read more directive, as many of you have heard. It ensures effective learning in our everyday clinical environment. But does this theory actually work? Well, here's a list of comparisons between classroom teaching versus experiential learning internships, uh, like internships or service learning, so basically community service with an academic structure, that show improvement in students' abilities. Included in this list is a VA bigwig, might, you might know, uh, Dr. Bob Holland's Experiential QI Curriculum for Residents, where he showed that through experiential learning activities or opportunities, increased quality improvement knowledge was gained. Because of these types of findings, quality improvement has become a topic that the ACGME has required throughout experiential learning, or through experiential learning. Janet Euler highlighted the theory's purpose nicely in this quote, which basically states that using knowledge and critical reflection will, will foster lifelong learning. So now we've talked about a couple of theories, and so what Ian and I wanted to do was test these out a little bit, and so I'd like to tell you how our quality improvement curriculum came to be. So as I was becoming um, involved in the fellowship um, for nephrology, Ian was graduating from his master's in education, and we both had an interest in adult learning. And thinking about this, um, we decided that um, we needed to test this out because it was not very well published. At the same time, being a new program director, I was reading all the rules and realized that we did not have any training in quality improvement in our fellowship. So I looked to some of the other fellowship programs, and although there were some things in QI that were going on, nothing that was directly translatable to my fellowship, and thought, gosh, we're busy. Program directors are busy. We don't necessarily know a lot about QI. Is there a way we could centralize this so not everybody had to take on that role? And luckily, Dr. Page and Dr. Zakowski came up with the idea of having some money, some funding for some um, projects in education. And so Ian and I decided to apply for some grant funding to be able to create a curriculum that could be delivered to the fellowship programs. So now we had learners, we had money, we had an idea of what we were going to teach, but we didn't know anything about QI. So luckily, Ryan Madison um, from Hematology Oncology had been trained in QI recently before this and decided to join our team and help us with some of the QI knowledge part of, of what we were doing. But we wanted this to be an asynchronous model, and we also didn't know anything about IT. So we got Do It and Kevin Thompson, who is a terrific person to help us with both education tips as well as um, technology. And... Um, a really great job of, of um, cartoonizing uh, <laughs> us uh, in our curriculum. So our aim was twofold. Uh, first, we wanted to create a curriculum that was online and for all of our fellows to learn and apply the principles of quality improvement within a one-year academic period. But the education aim was really to see if we could provide some sort of curriculum that could teach um, in, a, in these adult learning theories and see if it was effective. During our first online year, we planned the structure of our curriculum. This took a lot of time, but we used various existing software, such as Qualtrics for surveys, email, an articulate storyline, and Google Sites to create, and to create a site and house interactive didactic content. And this is what we came up with. This is the home page of our website many of you might be familiar with. But um, being completely asynchronous is a little bit of a misnomer because that becomes really hard when you don't know your learners. Um, so we actually do have a one, one in-person meeting with each of the divisions at the start of the curriculum. And we invite them to come in and uh, as their mentor, we meet with them one time. 
It helps them um, to see their new role as a fellow, um, but also tells them who their mentor is going to be. We talk a little bit about QI knowledge, things like the difference between QI and research. And we also um, talk about our learning system so they know how to navigate this moving forward. Lastly, we really want to spend some time brainstorming ideas for QI. And in doing so, we can direct them to relate the experiences they've had in medicine to be able to start to recognize where they might notice gaps in care that they hadn't before. So if we take in those learning theories that we talked about before, we're answering that why question. We're talking about their new role to inspire them to be ready to learn. And we're also um, applying their own patient experiences to the system to be able to engage them hopefully a little bit stronger. Here is what our, our first um, web page looks like that they get emailed after our, our um, meeting. And this is um, the design of it. And then um, really, it's available to them to do whenever they're ready to do it. And that was the other part of this. The fellows are busy. We can't say that they can do this all in one week, one month, and we can't plan when it's going to be. So we wanted it to be available whenever they had time to do it. Let's look at module two, for example, where fellows analyze their chosen problem. The first step for the learner is to watch a short seven minute video. Next, they apply what they learned in the video to create a process map about their project. This allows them to immediately apply the knowledge they gained from the video to their individual project. At the end of this work, fellows submit these assignments for feedback via the website. The learner completes a Qualtrics survey form and uploads the assignments they created. In this case, it's the process map for their selected project. Questions in the survey prompt them to reflect on the learning experience and apply the information they have just learned to their own project. This is in line with what literature says is effective experiential learning. So they're really going through our system, learning new pieces of information, but applying it to their chosen project. So each of the fellows has a project that they're working on to be able to apply to it. As a mentor, I then, after they've uploaded their homework, I actually get an email that's sent to me, and it has a link to a rubric. And in this rubric, um, this is a validated tool about QI that we've been able to translate into our grading system. That part is helpful because it, it aligns with some of the milestones that our, our program directors need to grade our fellows on. And so they get some information back um, just based on what this looks like. But probably the more important part is the, um, is the boxes. And so here I can give immediate feedback to the fellows about their project to be able to help them steer um, um, their project in a successful manner. This way they get that immediate feedback. And really, it's, it's really simple to do. I can do it on my phone. Um, and so it's easy to send them that feedback so they get it right away and can continue to move forward in their projects. And this cycle occurs for five modules. After receiving an email with feedback, fellows are given a link to the next module. And this process continues until their project is complete. The first three years, we hosted a year-end QI event that only included Department of Medicine fellows. The aim was to showcase quality fellows' quality improvement projects through poster presentations. But last year, we joined forces with UW Health to expand the size of the event. But the Department of Medicine made up about 50% of the projects presented. So this indicates we're kind of ahead of the ball in, teaching, uh, in terms of teaching QI. And this is also another place where they, where they receive feedback from a variety of people who attend. So outcomes was one of our goals. And so you know, aim one was really to look at whether or not we could create and deliver this curriculum. And the second one was to see whether it was going to be effective in our, in our learning assessments. So I'm happy to say we've created it um, and that it's easily deliverable um, to the various fellows that we've been able to, to enroll into our program. And we really want to thank the Department of Medicine program directors for their willingness to allow their fellows to enroll in our program as program participation has continued to increase over time. In this graph, the red bars indicate the percentage of programs participating in the curriculum, and the blue bars are the percentage of participating fellows. The green line indicates the number of developed projects, as some projects have multiple contributing fellows. We are pleased with the fact that all of these measures have continued to increase year after year. And the educational outcomes, as usual, are a little bit more tricky to measure. Um, we were happy to see that the pre- and post-test information that we got, got back from the fellows actually showed that the fellows do have a good amount of knowledge coming into this program. Um, but what we found, and this is harder to measure, is that their ability to apply it wasn't as good. 
And so they've needed more direction with their projects, but, but I think that that's the point of having experiential learning. We have seen the number of program, or projects increase as we've enrolled more learners. And probably my, um, my favorite thing is that their self-efficacy has increased. So their abilities, um, skills, and knowledge has, has increased according to their self-reporting. And that 95% of them think that they're going to use QI in their future. Um, and they kind of like our curriculum. So um, we've gotten good scores on that too. Sorry. <laughs> Um, as a fellowship coordinator, I was in charge of leading our fellowships through self-study for continued accreditation, along with many of you. This included a large-scale evaluation of multiple learning venues or environments in which our fellows learned at both the department and program levels. As a fellowship group, we voted to evaluate the quality improvement curriculum, so we convened a committee of program directors, fellows, and hospital quality improvement experts to identify barriers and guide refinement of the existing program. And here's a list of the barriers we identified. One thing I'd like to highlight is that we are lacking divisional stakeholder buy-in. We need a lot of quality improvement faculty mentors, and we're even willing to train you. Uh, we hosted our first successful quality improvement mentor training sessions in October, and have upcoming sessions listed there if you're interested in attending. So now we've talked about kind of some of these adult learning theories. We've shown you how we have chose to apply that. And so I just want to take the last few minutes to talk about ways that maybe you can translate that into your own teaching opportunities. So the first thing that I would like to share is you know, engaging the learner by connecting the information you want to share with them to what, they, what they're interested in is really important. And so take some time as you're starting out with a learner in your clinic, for, for example, to find out what they're interested in. It's sometimes, um, in the teacher's mind, easily connectable um, to see why this information would apply to them, but not necessarily true for all the learners. So find out what they like to do. Um, for example, in nephrology, I might direct a cardiology-bound resident more towards cardiorenal syndromes or contrast-induced nephropathy, or the glomerular diseases for the rheumatology-bound resident. This way, we're engaging their readiness to learn, and we're also um, helping them to apply this new information to their goals. The second tip um, that I, I'd like to share is to really think about their past experiences and help them connect that past experience to what you're trying to teach them. So thinking about as you're experiencing something such as a volume assessment, how does my volume assessment differ from yours? It helps you connect them to that self-reflection so that they think about what is it that I'm doing that's different instead of just being a passive observer. And that is kind of nice to, to be able to do um, to connect them. It, even in clinic, you can think about things like, you know, I would start with lisinopril, and this is one of the things I talk to primary care-bound residents about a lot. I would, I would start with lisinopril in my clinic. Would you choose to do that in yours? And so we're late relating that information to what their past knowledge is to be able to bring them forward and notice their gaps in, in some of the things that they might know. Now, as a teacher, it gets to be a little tricky uh, to shake things up a little bit, but when you do figure out that you have someone who is a little more self-directed, you might think about asking them how they want to run the service or asking them about how they want to round. Sometimes people like to do table rounds more than walking around. Some people like to see consults together or separated. And you might think about sh shaking that up a little bit. Ask them how they best want to go through didactics. Do they want to do questions or case, case conference? Do they have any other ideas? This way, for that self-directed learner, you're really bringing them into things, and, they're, and you're asking them, you know, how do you want to be a part of your learning? And the last one would be that I, I think that it's good for us as educators to really help point out gaps. We spend so much time talking about patient care and medical knowledge, but remember there are six core competencies. And so as Ian was talking about that experiential learning cycle, really finding those gaps are sometimes really hard to, hard to identify and really hard for the learners. Um, and you know, I've noticed in, in some of my other um, studies I've been doing that people don't actually find the ability to see gaps as, until they're towards the end of their, their residency program. And to be able to help them is a really, really um, good educational technique. So think about things that are outside of just that medical knowledge and patient care to point out. You know, I noticed when I was listening to you talk to that team that your communication style is a little bit different. Let's think about a different way to do that. Or, um, you know, you struggle gaining trust from patients. Let's talk about how you might do that better. And this way, you're really helping them identify those gaps to help them move forward. 
Just as a little summary slide, um, this is just kind of putting things all together. You know, really we're aiming for student engagement and figuring out how do we meet them where they are. Some people are a little more self-directed, a little less self-directed, but how can we use these different pieces to really bring in that engagement and, and encourage learning? So we hope that we've shared with you some of the differences that we see in adult learning. And hopefully we've convinced you it's possible to create an online curriculum that teaches learners from multiple subspecialties. And lastly, that you can translate some of these ideas into your clinical work. So first, thank you to the Education Committee for funding our project so that we could create this. The Department of Medicine for ongoing support for our year-end events and for faculty development sessions. Kevin Thompson of Do It um, and his contribution to um, creating this curriculum, as well as Ryan Madison. And many of our quality improvement consultants we sought uh, for advice in building and refining this curriculum. And the divisions of nephrology, hematology, oncology, and the Department of Medicine Education for their contributions of our time and kind to be able to work on this. Thank you. Thanks. So there are a few minutes for questions. Please, I'll ask Dr. Morris or Ian to repeat. statement was, you know, where did the funding go and how is this spent? And yeah, it, it costs um, a good amount of money, but he did a lot of work for us so that we spent very little time um, doing the technical build. But we needed that creative mind to be able to figure out how do we connect all these pieces so that it's smooth. And that is really great and probably why it was successful, because it, it really needs to be this, like, connection of all these emails and things back and forth to make all the pieces work. Yes? So the question was, how many of the projects that we saw through our curriculum were um, translated into publications, and none that we know of so far? But except ours. Except for ours. Ours is, ours is on the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you know, one thing is is getting the buy-in and some faculty support. So I just would like to highlight that again. Um, really, um, Ryan, Madison, and I have done the majority of the mentoring, and it's hard to um, hard to do that when you don't have that continuous connection with the fellows, um, that you see them on a daily basis. We were joking before, once in a while they hide when they see me. Um, and I don't want that to be the case, um, but rather if we, if we had more mentors within the department, I think we could do a better job of bringing it to a place where they do get published. And we also provide um, resources and some tips on, on how to publish um, and how to take that into publication. We've also uh, told them that we'd be willing to mentor them in doing that as well. Yeah. <laughs> the question has to do with uh, tracking our projects and being able to show the value of this of this curriculum. Um, honestly, I think that that is coming. Um, I, I feel like it's taken this amount of time to get the participation and to get the project up and running. And so we do have a system of tracking projects and tracking, um, you know, where is it going to go and how do we track when fellows leave? Because remember that we've got short times with a lot of these fellows. And so one of the things that we try to um, try to share with them is that we don't want them to do all the work because we want it to be something that continues. And so to be able to do that as we move forward will be definitely a goal. Thank you. Thank you very much for the good questions. Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs> Wonderful. So now I'll introduce Dr. Mariah Quinn. She graduated Cornell University Medical School, where she was inducted into AOA. She completed residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Following that, she completed an MPH at Harvard School of Public Health and a General Medicine and Faculty Development Fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Quinn is the Associate Program Director for Internal Medicine Residency. 
She has received a number of awards, most recently the Physician's Physician Award presented by the residents. She was also awarded the Greenmeyer Teaching Award for Excellence in Ambulatory Education. Dr. Quinn has been awarded grant funding for our, from our DOM Education Committee to develop an empathy curriculum for our house staff. She has published her findings regarding this topic, most recently in Academic Medicine and in the American Journal of Medicine. She will speak about this today as well. Thank you, Moran. Hello. I'm super excited to see so many residents here. <laughs> so I would like to start out by having us have a little experience together to tap into some of the things that we do in the course. So for those of you who are comfortable, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes. If you're not comfortable closing your eyes, just let your gaze be sort of soft on the chair in front of you. And I want you to let your mind sort of start floating over the last one to two days. As it floats, let it alight on a few moments where you felt like you were really engaged in something meaningful. You felt like what you were doing was important to you. This could be at work. It could be at home. It could be out in your community. And just let yourself linger in that moment. Notice what it feels like in your body when you feel like you're doing something meaningful. Do you feel calm? Do you feel energized? What are those sensations? Then start noticing the feelings that bubble up with it. What do your emotions do? Do you feel compassion, sadness, love, curiosity? You might even feel angry. What are those emotions that inform that feeling? Most of us who go into medicine and into education come with strong senses of meaning and purpose. And it's our values that really inform when we're going to find that. For many of us, those values include things like connection, kindness, relationships. For others, core values are things like expertise, security, tradition. When our values are aligned with what we're doing, we tend to find meaning. I imagine for some of you in this room, maybe a few, it might have actually been sort of difficult to find a moment to really focus on. And if that's the case, there might be a few things that can block that. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. If you'd like, you can open your eyes. So I'm going to transition now into really talking about a tale of two problems. The first is burnout or distress among care providers, and the second is reduced empathy. Now these are problems that affect all of us. So some of you may have seen the New England Journal of Medicine from January 25th, which had a couple of nice perspective pieces about the issues of burnout in medicine. And it summarized these two statistics, which you've probably seen before. 54% of U.S. physicians experience at least one symptom of burnout, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, or feeling disconnected from their patients, or a reduced sense of personal accomplishment. And up to 400 physicians per year die by suicide. Burnout is highly correlated with suicidal ideation and, and carrying out a suicide. So these are very significant problems for our medical students, residents, fellows, and faculty. So what we're going to cover today is a little bit more about kind of the scope of the problem. What are the problems with burnout, distress, and reduced empathy? What are some of the possible solutions for these problems? How are they related? Because I think they are. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a curricular innovation that we've made in the residency over the past three years that I co-created with Amy Zelensky um, to really address these issues. And I'll share with you some of the preliminary results. And like Ian and Laura, we were lucky to, re to receive some education committee funding to really support some of the evaluation that we're doing as well as to buy some materials that we use every year. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the scope of the problem. So let's start with burnout. So most of you in this room actually probably know what burnout feels like because over the course of a career, probably most people will experience it at least once. If you look at sort of college graduates, the age of medical students, there's actually some burnout there. The rate's about 36%. If you look at medical students in their clinical years, the rate goes up to almost 50%. So we think of our medical students as eager and energetic and wanting to learn, but actually a lot of them already experience signs and symptoms of burnout. If you look at residents and fellows, level goes up above 50%, slightly above. And then if you look at early career faculty, the levels come down to about 37%. So they drop, but not to the level of professionally matched peers. Medicine is kind of unique in that in medicine, having higher educational attainment does not protect you from burnout. And that's not true in other professions. 
depression has also been really associated with burnout, especially along that axis of feeling emotionally exhausted. And over the past 40 to 50 years, as people have studied this problem in medical trainees, it actually seems that despite our desire to have this be better and hoping the work hours limitations would reduce this problem, it's actually gotten worse. So on a calendar year by calendar year basis, the rate of significant depression symptoms goes up among residents. The rate's probably around 30%. And if you look at a training program and you look at everyone over time longitudinally, that rate, that sort of period prevalence is probably higher. So some people have really posited that we have a pipeline issue, that like medical students are just perfectionistic neurotics who are like overly prone to responsibility and guilt and that's why we have these problems. But the data wouldn't actually really bear that out. So if you look at college students who go to medical school, they actually tend to score higher in resilience, lower on burnout, and are happier and healthier than their age-matched peers. So there's really something about our educational system and our systems of care that actually create these problems as we go on. So as many of you know, because you've probably experienced burnout, it doesn't feel very good. And so the outcomes for physicians aren't great. They've been correlated with things like substance abuse, suicide, being more likely to be sued, um, having your patients not do quite as well. Um, the patient outcomes are, have been a little harder to look at, but they do include things like less safe prescribing practices, more prolonged recovery, um, and, system, and systems are really impacted by burnout too. One of the main reasons that doctors leave their jobs and move on to greener pastures is because they're burned out. And the most recent estimates would say that replacing a physician ranges in cost from $500,000 to $1 million. So if you can prevent 10 physicians from leaving a system and actually thriving and being productive in that system, that goes a long way towards filling budgetary gaps that we sometimes allude to in our current environment. So, um, and just to kind of piggyback on the importance of QI, there's been some moves to think about the fourth aim of physician satisfaction with system level care that should add on to the triple aim from the IHI. And that really would include things like incorporating physician satisfaction and other healthcare provider satisfaction with any QI intervention. When you change a workflow, that has to be something that we think about. So, can we do anything about it? Um, the answer is probably yes. So, this is a very busy figure, but I just want to really draw your attention to this right here. Um, so this is kind of the overall effect size estimate in a systematic review that was published in The Lancet in 2016, looking at a host of ways to reduce burnout. And these, in, 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 in all, it favored intervention. So these sort of range from really systemically focused interventions, things like changing workflows, the way that patients access us, things like that, how we schedule flexibility in work, to very sort of inter, you know, sort of individually focused interventions like communication skills training, mindfulness, and all of them on aggregate were better than nothing. Um, some people have really posited, so this would be like, you know, Christine Sinsky from the AMA, who some of you may have heard speak before, have estimated that about 80% of burnout comes from the system and about 20% is individual. So the question that I sometimes get asked very legitimately by residents is, if the problem is the system, why would you try to teach us something interpersonal, you know, sort of interpersonal to address the issue? And I think we need to really do both. The system is incredibly important. I think it's the reason that we end up in this problem. But I also think that it, even if it's just 20% that's us, if we have learners who start with us and are going to go work in other systems, we sort of owe it to them to give them all of the skills we possibly can to enable them to flourish and thrive no matter where they go. So let's transition to back to our college students. They're so happy to be graduating from college. They also, if they're bound for medicine, are more empathic than their age-matched peers. But what happens with training? It's not good. So over time with medical education, and this, this starts in medical school and actually continues in residency, if you look at the historical literature, empathy levels fall. And there's very few papers out there that would show that this rebounds after you leave training. Maybe one, maybe in psychiatry, not clear. Um, so, this is important. So what do I mean when I'm talking about empathy? Empathy can be sort of a loaded term that is sort of unclear what it means for a lot of people. Some people think of empathy as being the same as sympathy. Sympathy, come, the roots of the word sympathy means to feel with. And in sympathy what happens is that we really resonate with the other person sort of emotionally and we ask ourselves, what would I feel if I were in your position? So it's actually sort of a self-focused way of relating to another person. It can be sort of exhausting. It can feel sort of dangerous when we get close to someone else's suffering if we're imagining our own self experiencing that suffering. 
Empathy, on the other hand, is a little bit of a different concept. It does involve some of that like emotional resonance, sort of feeling with the person a little bit, but it acknowledges that that other person is a different person and really asks the question, what do you feel in your shoes? What is your position in the world? What is your perspective on this? So it's essentially an other-focused activity. Um, compassion, which kind of overlaps with empathy, is really our response to suffering, and compassion is the desire to alleviate suffering. So it's kind of the helping, outgoing arm of empathy. So why does empathy matter? I think some people could ask, maybe empathy falls with medical training because we need better boundaries because it's like too painful to be that close to people who are suffering. So maybe this is something that's, you know, just, it has to happen. It's just part of what needs to happen. But the studies would actually show that our patient outcomes and physician outcomes are better when empathy skills are higher. So for patients, these include things like better adherence to their chronic disease management medications, better functional and symptom improvement, higher safety, better loyalty and satisfaction with their care, just kind of getting back to the, a business case for empathy. Um, a really broad set of outcomes that cross disease states. If you look at physician outcomes, they include things like increased meaning in work, reduced burnout, reduced risk of being sued, greater self-efficacy, better diagnostic accuracy. So all things that we actually really want for our doctors and patients. So it's really interesting. Here we have a skill that we actually have our students enter with a high level of, and we seem to actually make it worse over training. So some people think that empathy is something that you can't really teach. It's something you can apparently unteach, so that's interesting. Um, but we're really good at that, traditionally. Um, it's interesting. So we've been looking over all of our applications for our rank list for the match, which is going to come up soon. And as you read letters, you'll sometimes read sentences like, student Dr. Smith really has empathy and compassion for their patients, and that is just something that can't be taught. Which is interesting, because I've never read the same comment about reading EKGs or interpreting arterial blood gases. Um, occasionally, surgeons write that like, people have innate surgical skills, which is interesting. But, but empathy and compassion seem to be sort of a blind spot. We think we can't teach it. So is this true? No. All right, so these are data from WeTalk. So I would just like to thank Dr. Zelensky and Dr. Campbell for allowing me to use this slide. But this is the pre-post data, self-reported on, on an empathy measurement called the CARE measure. There's one here that doesn't look significant. That's plan of action. I would consider that like the internal con control on the hemocult card. The fact that that's negative is actually good, um, you know, th that it didn't change. Otherwise, everyone who went through WeTalk estimated that their skills went up in these, in these empathy domains with training. But like it's self-report, so we could be dubious about that. But so what does it look like to our patients? So our patients actually also noticed that we improved. So this is from patient satisfaction data comparing physicians who had gone through WeTalk with those who had not gone through WeTalk yet. So they were coming, but they hadn't done it yet. And so, and this is the estimate for how likely they were to rate their physician in the top box of showing care and concern. So it's essentially a, a measure of interpersonal empathy and compassion. WeTalk, for those of you who, who haven't had it yet, like some of our interns in the room who haven't yet had it yet, is really focused on giving bad news, but the fundamental skills are empathic communication skills, and that's what people really took out of it. So I'd like to move on a little bit to talking about how distress and empathy might be related to one another. So this is really, really interesting. A lot of people have worried that empathy is going to burn us out, that if we're too close to our patients, we're going to feel worse, and we're not going to be able to continue doing our jobs. But if you look at the research about this, that is not really what we see. We actually see that more empathically engaged providers actually seem to be buffered against stress. And there might be some reasons that we could imagine this would be. There's a neuroscientist uh, named Stephanie Brown who really studies helping behavior. And she's done some very interesting work looking at motivations for helping behavior. And in her study, she looks at two pathways. One is I'm going to help you because I'm going to look good doing it. Like, I'm going to get a good grade on my clerkship, or I'm going to get a good letter for fellowship, or I'm going to get a bonus because my patient satisfaction scores will be really good. Um, or maybe, like, I just want to, this is what I think I should do, so I'm going to do it. It comes from a sense of obligation, but it's kind of extrinsically and self-servingly motivated. In those situations, helping behavior does go up a little bit, but the other pathway is actually wanting to help out of wanting to help, like compassion and empathy. And when that happens, 
there's a really interesting thing that happens in our bodies, which is that we actually get some stress regulation. Our heart rates drop, our stress hormones go down, and so the motivation for us engaging with our patients closely actually matters somewhat for how we're going to feel and probably how they're going to do. If you look at studies of altruism in general, altruism is much higher when people aren't really concerned about the self and obligation. It's much better when they're just really worried about the other. So this gives a little bit of a hint as to why more empathically engaged, engaged physicians might actually feel a little better than their peers. All right, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about our curriculum. So our curriculum is called the Empathy Course. And the reason it's called the Empathy Course is to really help people focus down on those skills that are going to enable them to really relate to other people while building some of their skills for themselves. Um, and the reason it's empathy and not compassion is that empathy encompasses all emotions. So you can have empathic joy. Uh, we do get to celebrate with our patients sometimes. We're not always giving them bad news. We have to tune into the things that are meaningful for them when we do things like motivational interviewing. And so we really wanted to build skills that would relate to all emotions. So our goals in this course are really to develop our residents' skills, attitudes, and knowledge to help them have meaningful and effective relationships with their patients and be buffered against stress and actually build their well-being. And for our objectives, we wanted them to learn that these encompass learnable skill domains that they can practice and get better at over time, that they're not fixed, that they can grow, and to practice their skills in a safe and progressively challenging environment to improve the empathy skills and hopefully reduce burnout. Those are our big aims. Um, so we have a lot of activities that we do. And the reason for this is that it's really been shown that attitudes towards empathy and learning empathy are highly dependent on personality, on learning style, on demographics, and on past experience. And so the goal here was like, if I put a plate of noodles with lots of different flavors, hopefully at least everyone would find one noodle they liked a little. And then maybe they would like try the other noodles, just to kind of get people hooked in, hoping that if we gave them a big enough menu that something would kind of stick. So let's go through some of these activities. So the growth mindset is something that's most, most widely been studied by Carol Dweck, who's a psychologist at Stanford. And the growth mindset is really a mindset towards challenge. It says, if I, if I see something that's difficult, I think that with effort I can get better at it. And I will improve over time, as opposed to if I face a challenge and I fail at it, I'm not going to look very good. So, when people are trained in growth mindset, and this has been studied a lot in K through 12 education in particular, they actually get better, like their math skills get better, for instance. And interestingly, this is particularly important when it comes to relationship type skills, because people tend to have a fixed mindset, like our letter writers in the Dean's letter, for instance, about these types of skills. So this is something we teach during orientation and revisit periodically throughout the course. We also spend a fair amount of time for those who like love evidence and things like that, talking about the evidence base, sort of like how our patients are affected when we're burned out or when, we're, when we have poor empathy and vice versa. Also talking about sort of neuroscience of stress and resilience and connection, how we feel other people's emotions. And then we do a lot of experiential learning. So these are some of our interns engaged in some improvisational theater games this year. And improv, um, which Dr. Zelensky really brings to the curriculum, is an, an incredible way to learn a number of skills, like close listening, paying attention to nonverbals, how we attend to and respond to emotion, um, and just kind of being present when there's no script, which is like essentially all of life, right? So, so improvisational theater can be a little anxiety provoking for some of our learners at first, but like no one's died yet, and mostly they actually have a really good time doing it, um, and they learn some skills. Then we spend some time at the Chazen Art Museum on campus, which for those of you who haven't been there, is a wonderful museum. And at the museum, we practice things like observational skills, understanding what perspective we bring and what perspectives other people bring around us, negotiating those different perspectives as a team, um, really thinking about how we, what stories we kind of project onto the world in a really safe place where we can't hurt the art as long as we don't touch it, which isn't allowed. Um, so the art museum is a really great place to practice these kinds of skills. And art viewing in general has been shown to be associated with higher empathy levels. Whether you're doing something didactic in an art museum or not, it's helpful. We also do some narrative exercises kind of spread throughout the course to enable us to really get down into experience and think about it. And often through sharing those writings together really to build some community and reduce isolation. It's amazing when you talk to doctors in general, but particularly residents, how often they don't realize everyone around them is having the same hard experience they are. 
Um, probably one of the side consequences of the work hours limitations is just less time working with people at your level. You just kind of cross and sign out to each other. So this is an opportunity to do some of that. And then we train people in compassion and self-compassion. And some of this is through sort of doing self-compassion exercises. This is based on the work of Kristen Neff. Um, and self-compassion is interesting. It basically, it, it aims compassion at the self. Recognizing oneself as human, one's own failings is something that can be looked at sort of gently. And it's actually been associated with increased mastery-oriented activity, reduced levels of depression and anxiety. And a lot of the compassion training is through compassion and loving-kindness meditation, also, which has a pretty robust evidence base behind it. I'd like to really also just comment that Lisa Grant, who couldn't be here today, really developed the core components of our curriculum that, that relate to resilience and self-awareness. And she's been really kind in donating some of her time to the residency to come and do trainings with us and our residents. Um, and these resilience practices include things like breath work, mind body work, like a little bit of super gentle yoga, it's like no inversions or anything scary, um, some more meditation techniques, guided imagery, positive emotion cultivation, like gratitude practice, and we do this kind of throughout the course. So how the course works in terms of like the sort of progression through it, um, and when we first started this, we thought it would, would really be an intern course, and then we We've been building more content so that we now have three years. So year one is really these fundamental skills. All of the things that I just talked about, they go through in eight sessions. Um, year two, we continue the resilience and self-awareness work, and then we do some more like specific skill building focused kind of sessions, like we talk in a session on goals of care, which Dr. Sarah Johnson's developing this year, um, when we had our first version of last year. Um, and also, how you think about leader, about empathy and compassion in teams and leadership, because that transition from the intern year to the PG2 year is just a huge professional transition. In the third year, we have a session that I built with Dr. Bob Holland around communicating around error, uh, around error, what the role of compassion and empathy and self-compassion is in that setting, and we'll really focus on transitioning to lifelong learning. Like, so these are learnable skills. How are you going to take this when you leave residency and go to fellowship and, or practice and continue to build these skills? So, what the class really looks like is eight sessions for our PG1, six for our PG2s, and four for our PG3s. And they're kind of long sessions because they're really experiential. So we might go to the art museum, we might be playing improvisational theater games, we might be doing some resilience practices, and they're mixed together with didactics, and so they certainly take some time. We now have 85 residents who've been through at least a part of the curriculum. Our interns are halfway through their first year. Um, this is the first year we have PG3 content, so this is 85 partially trained residents. Um, and the grant support we got in 2015 and 2016 has really enabled us to do some more robust evaluation, um, as well as to have materials that are used in our sessions. Um, so I would like to share some preliminary results with you, and these are really based on our first year. So our, this year's graduating PG3s were our interns that year, and they're very awesome. Um, so. One of the hypotheses that we had going into this was that there were probably some kind of some high leverage skills that if we could improve those, we would see improvements in both empathy and burnout. And to that end, we collected some data about a scale called the Emotional Styles Inventory, which is a scale that was developed by Richard Davidson on campus here. Um, and the reason we chose is that, is that it focuses on sort of neurobiologically underpinned but also modifiable domains that, for which there are suggestions for how you might sort of move yourself along. Um, and they include things like self-awareness, resilience, you know, sort of positive outlook, attention, all kinds of things like that. And what we found is that there were two domains that correlated pretty significantly with the outcomes we cared about. So resilience kind of, you would guess probably that if you're more resilient, you're less likely to be burned out. And that sort of looks to be the case. If you're, le if you're more resilient, you're less likely to be emotionally exhausted you're also less likely to experience a lot of personal distress. Um, and this is actually an empathy domain. If you're more distressed when you're exposed to someone who's suffering, you're actually less likely to approach them and help them. So it's an important sort of negative predictor of empathy. So resilience helped with both of those. Self-awareness, interestingly, touched both domains pretty strongly. So self, if you're more self-aware, you're less likely to be emotionally exhausted and depersonalized and more likely to have low personal distress, kind of like with resilience, but also to have better skills at perspective taking, which is actually super interesting because it's a self-focused skill that actually leverages into an other focused skill. And I could go on for 15 minutes about why I think that is, but I won't because um, it's very cool. Um, and it's one of the reasons we really focus on those resilience and self-awareness skills during years two and three of the curriculum. 
So if you want, if in order to understand a little bit about what we might be doing to our, the outcomes we cared about, I just want to orient you to what we would sort of historically expect. And this is based on the 27 residents who participated in our first year's evaluation. So these are like tiny numbers, and so there's mathematical modeling and small numbers. But um, so these are our burnout measures and our empathy measures. And what you would expect over the course of internship is to see burnout get worse. What you would expect over the course of internship with empathy is for it to get worse. And so what you sort of saw, what we saw pre-post in our interns was actually that they didn't vary that much, which felt like a maybe small victory, <laughs> that they didn't actually get worse. Um, and when we looked at sort of what was happening with the dose effect of coming to our course, it looked like coming to more sessions was significantly associated with reduced emotional exhaustion, improved sense of personal accomplishment, and a trend towards improving levels of empathic concern, which is really like how warmly and caringly you feel for someone who's suffering. So preliminary data and causation, correlation, maybe if you're less emotionally exhausted, you come to more sessions. I don't know. But, but hoping that the aggregate data would suggest that we at least kept things from getting worse. Um, people attended the sessions pretty well, so median attendance was about seven of nine sessions, which is actually much better than I thought it was going to be considering vacations and post-call and duty hours and things like that, or just skepticism. Um, and in general, people liked components of the course. Many people liked a lot of the course. Most people liked some of the course. And so these are kind of their, their favored methods. People really enjoyed the experiences they had in the improv sessions and at the art museum in general. Um, and they also liked the mindfulness and resilience practices a lot. And several people commented that they found the growth mindset oriented um, uh, material really useful. And they were able to tell us that they used what they learned. And interestingly, people who like said they didn't like improv very much clearly articulated they learned things used during improv. So, so it's interesting and gave me some comfort that even if we were giving people a little bit of medicine, like there was a little bit of goodness coming out at the end. Um, so what we've covered today is these two big problems of burnout and distress among physicians and reduced empathy. I talked a little bit about the fact that there probably are solutions for these. Um, Thing, you know, improvements that we can make. We talked about oh, our curricular innovation within the residency and shared some preliminary results with you. And I would just really like to thank this very long list of people quickly. Our residents and chief residents first, who really very trustingly and open-mindedly and open-heartedly come to this course and support our residents getting to the course and cover each other when they're leaving for the course. Um, I'd like to also really thank uh, Dr. Vogelman for really supporting this curriculum with a lot of time and bandwidth for the residents and really giving us a lot of autonomy and freedom to develop this. I'd like to thank the Department of Medicine faculty who also cover teams when their residents disappear. I hope this has sort of made it more clear about where they're going and why. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Strobridge and Paige for really giving me some flexibility to have some extra time for teaching this course. Um, and Dr. Zelensky, without whom this course probably wouldn't really exist and wouldn't be even half as good. Um, and also the Department of Medicine Education Committee for the grant funding and support. Thank you. I'm sure there are many questions. There's time for one question, and others can come up afterwards. Yes. Yeah, that was awesome. So, of course, you know what I'm interested in. So, <laughs> So that's a really good question. I will tell you one limitation in our data of a, as a quirk of that class is that we had a very small number of women, actually. And so we didn't do much with kind of the gender differences and what was happening in this class. I think that there may be some gender differences that over time we'll start to see emerge. Um, I think the data about women physicians being more burned out but also on aggregate having higher levels of empathy is very interesting and I think might capture some of the other role concerns and conflicts that are more likely to come in for, for women, not universally, but I wonder if that has something to do with it. I just don't think we know enough about how these might sort of function differently for different people yet to fully answer that. But on an aggregate, empathy does seem to be associated with reduced burnout. We'll just have to see. Yeah. 
Sorry, we have to end Grand Come Ramones. Come talk to me afterwards. Please, yes. And anybody <laughs> who wants to join the rest of Education Day 1220 in the Centennial Building is where we're meeting again in about 15 minutes to start the rest of the morning session. So thank you.